is weird. Um, so, um, so yes, yeah, so so welcome everyone to uh, Neil's uh, exhibition and uh, to our audiences uh, across the world watching this. Um, and um, Neil, Neil and I actually spoke the night. Um, we, we met met for a drink and kind of preparation for today. And in a, in a funny way, it would have been um, it would it would have been quite a nice chat to uh, to share with everybody, uh, or maybe not. I don't know. No, I think it would have been. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, hope, I hope we can keep it in that tone. Yeah. So there's, there's a performative nature of these things with an audience and people watching. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I mean, it, it um, in some ways, um, you know, I don't want to necessarily sort of, sort of uh, go through every kind of question or every um, every iteration of our conversation the night. But I think there are some things that emerged and that I wanted to, in some ways, maybe touch upon today. Mm. And uh, and I think um, in particular because this is this is quite a it's quite a big occasion really for yourself because this is your first solo exhibition in London for quite some time, isn't it? Seventeen years. Ago. Seventeen years. Okay, so um, so in a sense, I just thought that perhaps it would be nice to, before we start sort of discussing the work sort of in detail, to maybe uh, try and create some context about uh, your history, your, you know, who is Neil Rock? You know, where who is Neil Rock? way in which you've sort of forged that kind of international career really over the last sort of 17 20 years um with with, with i mean i was trying to remember all the residencies that you've done on uh, mm. you know all the different sort of uh, places iowa japan nevada virginia um i kind of wrote them all down in the end said yeah, i don't think it's necessary to sort of go through all of them but what i wanted to 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 begin with um, and in a sense, uh, what today shares in common with the night. So I'm curious if you could say a little bit about um, your memories or your time growing up in Port Talbot in Wales. And in particular, um, and I'll come back to this in a moment, in particular ideas of, of, of the landscape or the weather, uh, the place, and not necessarily so much... Um, you know what was happening at the time, but in a sense, describing uh, the, the physicality of the place and uh, what Port Talbot sort of still means to you. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, it's funny because um, it's kind of coming full circle now because we I run a I run a residency program in Charlottesville, Virginia, which is now where I, I spend most of my time, um, and we have. Um, two artists in residence that have um, a studio on a, for a year um, in Charlottesville. And this is the first year where we've, op we've offered them a residency in Wales. So they're mm -hmm. actually, um, one of them is here now, an artist called Virginia Gibson. She's in the gallery, but she's, she's in residence in Swansea. The reason why I'm saying that is that yesterday we took a drive. I took them actually, uh, Vibba VJ and, and Virginia, up to the uh, Avon Valley over into the Rhonda which is, I spent a lot of time as a kid. And it's funny you were talking, I and mean, actually was telling Virginia about this yesterday, about I've always felt that the Welsh Valley, particularly the Avon and the Rhonda Valley, they're very vertical landscapes. And actually okay. Sarah Jones is here as well, so she's got familiarity with that landscape too. Um, I feel that there's something really important about a landscape that is vertical, mm -hmm. that it's not, it doesn't expand out, it actually faces you frontally, almost very, very, in a very pictorial way. Mm. Um, but so many, um, like the texture of the landscape, the roughness of the landscape, the way that communities have forged living in those landscapes, you know, it, it, it's the heartland of the Welsh mining, mm. what form of mining communities. So a landscape pock pock marked by industry. Port Albert also has the largest steelworks, I think, in Britain. Mm. So that was also something that marked landscape. And, um, and I think if you look at the work that I make, I mean, the kind of physicality of the work, the, mm. the relationship between something that is frontal, pictorial, but also kind of bodily and for, you know, has, has form, mm. um, I, you know, it, there's, there's obviously some relationship mm. to that. And um, um, yeah, and also that kind of dichotomy between the, you know, the the industry, the steelworks, mm. this, 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 this um, mm. huge monolith that, uh, 
you know, marks the landscape of Portalba, and then then the kind of the you know, the, the valleys, the mountains, the mm. reservoirs. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, but I was thinking about this last night. I was thinking of trying to find a way to have a thread through, uh, in a sense, the uh, the kind of origin story of your work, which uh, I remember from an exhibition that I curated uh, around two thousand and five, which is closer stylistically to work that you were making when you graduated from your uh, MA at CSM. Mm. And it, it was slightly more extruded shapes. It was slightly more, uh, and, it's, it, and it, it was kind of, they were more sort of horizontal as well, rather than, um, or as I remember them, they were more kind of planar rather than these sort of objects that sort of uh, present themselves in front of you. Mm. Um, and I was thinking about how in some ways to find a way to navigate through everything that you've done um, leading us to, you know, to this exhibition sort of, uh, today. And I don't know why, I mean, I, and I just kept thinking um, that, um, and, it's, and it's, probably, it's probably totally um, off kilter, but I was thinking about the way in which something that a lot of artists have in common without realizing is a kind of relationship to, to weather, you know, to climatic conditions. Uh, you know, so if you think, for example, you know, sort of jo George O'Keefe sort of work in the desert, you know, if you think about even the sort of uh, New York school, this kind of indoor weather that they have with this kind of like single light bulb and sort of no air in a room, etc. And I was thinking about this idea sort of weather that develop almost beyond, you know, whether it's raining or sunny, but more like the whole structure of like things that you have to have with you, like say, you know, if you live in the UK, everybody has an umbrella, you know, but, you know, if you live in California, maybe it's something that you have like in the beach and you rent to keep the sun rather than the rain away. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking about, you know, still sort of just want to stay uh, in Port Talbot just for a little bit longer and just think uh, if there's something that you could say something about that kind of relationship to the place in terms of like temperature oh, yeah, yeah. or, um, your, you know, your, your, you know, your bodily relationship, I guess, to the place through this idea of uh, climate, you know. It's a very changeable climate, you know. Um, you can have in one day rain, uh, clouds, mist, uh, mm. sun. Um, but I don't know, in terms of like the work that was making, if you want to go back to that, you know, mm. I guess maybe, maybe I'm jumping forward to London when, you know, the show that you were talking about. Um, of Wales. I mean, it's it's renowned as a place of rain and mist, right? Mm. You know, and gloomy, and people complain a lot about, mm. um, you know, not getting a lot of sun. You know, there's that kind of thing. Um, so, I think in a way, I mean, a lot of that early work, particularly with the Union from the early two thousands, was almost a kind of the anti that, right? So you have these mm. um, candy coloured, you know, synthetic, mm. polychromatic, um, garish color palette mm. that was in a lot of the early work. So I don't, there's, there's maybe a sense of that it was an antidote to that or a kind of reaction to that. But I also think, you know, the East End of London, which is where I was living at the time, was also was a pretty gloomy place in many ways. Mm. Um, depends on who, you, who we speak to, I suppose. Um, but I also think now I've lived in so many different places, it's difficult to say. Because you know, I, I then moved to LA, right? I lived in LA for 15 years, wow. 14, 15 years in mm. LA, where you know, the, the sense of light, mm. you know, and I actually remember, I'm probably jumping away from your question a bit, but I think I remember when I first moved to LA, actually I was in Vegas. My first job was in the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. I took a residency there. The artist called Stefan Hendy gave me a residency. And I remember driving through the Mojave Desert mm. in this beaten up old Chevy S10 truck to go to LA to live and just feeling that um, that landscape was just incredible mm. and completely the opposite to the way I grew up. So, um, but going back to Wales, yeah, I, you know, I, yeah, obviously it's affected me. I have a very strong affection. I mean, even when I was there with Virginia and Viva mm. yesterday, driving through the Avon Valley up over into the Rhonda, um, into Triorchy, and I still get these you know, I feel like my body is part of that landscape. Mm. Because, you know, when once you, it, there's a difference between looking at a landscape for, for, for the first time or you don't have a memory. But when you look at a landscape and you've literally been all over the place, you know, you've, I've, you know, walked around a lot of those mountains. I know what's behind those mountains. Like the, things get imbued with a sense of, mm. there's a richness with the memory there. 
Mm -hmm. I don't think that one is any quite. Um, no, it, actually, you 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 led nicely to the the next thing that I was thinking about. You know, the way in which you've moved around, sort of, um, or, you know, you, you've travelled. You know, your your practice is taking it to many places, <laughs> and the way in which uh, I was wondering whether that was something that you you noticed, for example. You know, you you've just sort of um, completed a residency in Japan. Was it in twenty twenty two? That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so you were in Japan in twenty twenty two. Um, you know, you're talking about Nevada, you were talking about, um, you know, your assistant professor uh, in uh, Virginia University. You know, so I'm kind of thinking of all these different places and I was just thinking whether that was something that you kind of in some form responded to whenever you moved, you know, whether it's like uh, you were talking about um, the light or, you know, in the, the American desert is such a mythical place that I just wonder whether in some ways there is something that um, has been common throughout those experiences in relationship to different sort of climatic conditions or? Yeah, some, I mean, I think maybe indirectly, because even when I was in LA, I, you know, I was back and forth, I was doing a PhD at the RCA. Mm. Um, and I, so that, you know, on the one hand, I'm in, I'm still in London, I'm making work, there's a community of artists that were at the RCA that were, Two of them are you. I mentioned Sarah Jones, who the lead training is here as well. And so there was, you know, on the one hand, you you know, you're having conversations with people that are expanding your ideas about art, or you know, mm -hmm. having conversations about different possibilities for for, for practice. Um, and then going back to LA, you know, it's always at, at the RCA having these conversations with Lee and Sarah and people like um, Ian Keir and, and others, right? Mm -hmm. And then I was going back to LA, and I was I was a bartender in LA, and I'm camping out in the desert. Mm -hmm. So, um, in terms of the work, I do I do think there was a shift in the work in terms of mm -hmm. um, I think there was an emotional like likeness in the work that came around that time. Mm -hmm. Whether that was that kind of open expanse of space mm -hmm. um, um, and, and the light that I was experiencing out there, there's, there, you can see a definite shift from I would say two thousand and nine mm -hmm. to two thousand and fourteen for sure. Um, and I think that maybe being between these landscapes is part of it. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think it was, on the one hand, being part of a research culture and thinking about um, mm -hmm. different possibilities for the work as well. Yeah. Yes, yeah, interesting. You were saying about um, making certain works around uh, two thousand three, two thousand five. Uh, you know, when you had, you know, you had a sort of show effect projects soon after graduating from CSM yeah, yeah. and you were talking about this kind of you know synthetic sort of candy color etc possibly as a as a kind of function to maybe the the, the palettes you know of uh, you know hypothetically the palettes of um, uh, whales etc but in a strange sense and I mean I could be completely wrong it seems like there's been a kind of like um, not reversal of that, but it seems to be like in sort of some of these recent works um, or works in, in recent years, there's been a sort of a softening of that palette. Mm. Um, it's it's got away f or it's moved away from being, you know, um, I mean, at one time it reminded me not, not just of people like uh, Fabian Macaccio, but yeah. Also, um, the glass maker Chihuly, you know, there was almost like, <laughs> Dear, did you, Dear, did you, yeah. get out of here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, you know, you know but, but, but now there's a kind of like, um, and I don't know whether this is to do with, you know, what, what it's to do with, you know, whether, you know, there's, there's been a sort of direct uh, influence as such. However, something that I did notice um, in this issue of Terps uh, magazine, uh, which, fun enough, you gonna you gonna pull up a court and hold me to hold me to the cause? <laughs> no, I'm not. No, I mean I'm not. I mean, and I, I don't have to. I mean, I don't have to. Um, yeah, I, I don't have to sort of even go there if you, know, yeah, yeah, if you don't want to. No, no, go uh, but um, uh, not so much in these works. Uh, uh, but the the works that I'm referring to are paintings by an artist called uh, a Welsh artist called Michael Freeman, who was a very uh, influential sort of you know figure in your life um and you know um in some ways it's <laughs> i don't know if they can hear that on the, uh, on the stream with, uh, some um, colorful, colorful in the back. yeah but but there were some works uh, not not necessarily all of these works but there were some works uh, that i researched uh, and i'm not i'm not making 
uh, I'm not sort of trying to make a direct connection, but it, it, it occurred to me that there was a sort of similarity um, in some ways to, to this kind of like softer palette, uh, um, uh, you know, sort of layered in a different work uh, by works uh, by, by this artist, Michael Freeman. Mm. Um, and I just wondered whether, you know, maybe, I mean, you, I mean you've, you, you had a conversation with him in 2015, he's sort of passed yeah. away since. Mm. But I just wonder whether maybe we could sort of talk about that just for a little yeah, bit. Absolutely. About what he, yeah, absolutely, of course, yeah. What would, what would you like to know? Well, no, I mean, uh, I mean, we we just we we talked about this uh, the other night, um, yeah. Uh, and so, in a sense, it's more for the benefit for people who might not know who Michael Friedman is, or oh, you mean in terms of yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you know, he was. Um, um, I mean, I think one one of the things to kind of keep in mind about Friedman was that he was based in Swansea, obviously, right? He's mm. an artist from Wales, but. He was teaching um, in amateur painting classes in um, local towns like Port Talbot, Neath, mm. Swansea. And he was funded by the WEA, the Workers' Education Association. Um, so, you know, the WEA's mission, you know, at the beginning of the 20th century was to provide adult education in areas of socioeconomic deprivation, right? Mm. Um, and he, you know, Freeman was very staunchly kind of anti-authoritarian, kind of anti-institution. And he didn't have much time for Swansea Art School, even though he'd be gone there as a, as a student. Um, so essentially what that meant was for me was that he was teaching in this local community center, art center in Port Talbot, teaching retirees from the steelworks, essentially people from you know, the local mm. industry, teaching them painting and drawing. Um, and I, I got kind of taken under his wing at the age of 11. Uh, a local painter called Jack Edwards had seen one of my drawings and taking them to Mike. Mm. And I got ushered over to the Avon Art Centre. And Mike, mm. I remember Mike, I think I was 11, and he said, look, I don't teach children, but if you stay in my class, I'll teach you. So mm. I stayed with him for 10 years, and and he gave me, I think, one of the, the biggest gifts I think I've ever had, mm. you know? Because um, he didn't just teach me about painting, he was doing a lot of slide lectures. So, you know, he was the one that introduced me to people like Gwen John, Mirandi, mm. listening to, you know, Bruckner, Mahler, Mm. Symphonies. Um, Bo, you may remember he gave me my first book of Borges, mm -hmm. Jorge Luis Borges. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in where I was in South Wales, you know, in terms of the educational system, you know, with the local comprehensive schools, we just weren't getting that kind of education. Mm. So this is, you know, that, that's a kind of layered conversation, right? Because we're talking about, intimidate. we're talking about access to the arts, access to education. Um, and, um, and yeah, it was, and you know, he became a mentor and mm. very much a father figure to me. And um, and now, and now I'm the custodian of his of his estate and mm. um, running a residency program for young artists as well. So there's a lot of things in mm. there. Um, but I also think, you know, I I've come to realize in the last five or six years that his work is, you know, phenomenal. Mm. You know, I, I didn't know what really his output was. Nobody really knew his output for a long time because that the the paintings were stored in the upstairs bedrooms of his house, mm. just all over the floor. So you were talking about 60 years worth of work, over a thousand artworks, just covering the floor of his upstairs bedroom. So we built racks, my, myself and a friend mm. of his, put the work, you know, archived, archived the work and then started to kind of look at it and assess it. So, mm. um, so yeah, there's multiple strands really in terms of who he was, mm. uh, his relationship to education, that particular, the socio-economics and politics mm. of that time in South Wales, and then also we're also thinking about you know you know what is a life's work you know and, and what his output was and what he what he did. Yeah, no, I mean it must have been um, what it is 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 quite an amazing, really um, um, gift to say experience. You know, um, in terms of having that kind of um, type of education from an early age, but the kind of uh, the depth of inquiry and sort of uh, the totality you know, of, you know, of it being music and literature and, you know, and in fact, one of the things that I've always been very, in addition, you know, to being very drawn to your work, one of the things that I've always been very struck is that you're very, um, I mean, you're very well read, you know, you're very kind of, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> says, uh, I used to think so until I did my PhD. Well, let's just, Let's just say that you are. Let's just, you know, trust me, you are. And I'm always slightly, and, and I know that there's a sense of kind of like, um, 
you know, that there's something about the word that contains that, you know, that sort of, you know, the, the thinking element, you know, this, this kind of uh, rigor, uh, but something that then going back to this exhibition that then I'm sort of drawn to, uh, or that I'm sort of inquisitive about, it's, for example, the title, and then you, 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 mentioned, you mentioned Jorge Luis, uh, Jorge Luis Borges, uh, you mentioned poetry, uh, also the night, and I'm, I'm, I was wondering whether you could say then something about this sense of uh, reading or, or specifically poetry that is in connection to these works. Yeah, I mean, poetry has become more important over the last... Um, or five years. Mm. Um, I never read, read a lot of poetry growing up, actually. It was more literature and, and, and theory, philosophy, you know, because we're also, you know, you and I and, and others that are around the same age, we're of a generation where, you know, there's a particular kind of theory that was, you know, mm. prevalent in British art schools, you know, French post-structuralist theory, um, feminist thinkers that came out of that, right? Um, mm. But recently, for me, thinking about, um, you know, people like Rilke, contemporary poets like um, Joanna Klink, um, uh, American poets that are in a kind of an elegiac tradition. Mm -hmm. um, and I was also thinking about the relationship of elegy to kind of, you know, um, sound, uh, you know, the origins of, of, of elegy into, well, actually different, different origins of elegy from Greek origins, Celtic origins, mm. um, Australian indigenous origins have the energy or, or kind of songs of lament mm. um, or poetry of lament coming from a, a kind of a wailing or a sound or a kind of um, uh, a singing. So there's this relationship to something that's um, sonorous or um, um, something that's heard, you know, the physicality, the embodied sense of sound in relation to mm. a word, for example. Um, um, the way a word will sound, you know, the, the way a, 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 poem, a poem is read, the, mm. the, the tone, the texture. I mean, if you want to go to, you know, uh, the grain of the voice, you know, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Yeah. Um, so, so I think for me, the elegy and elegy and loss, for various reasons that are, I guess, personal as well over the last four or five years. Of, of um, um, I think that the the, the, the the a lot of this relation to line. Mm. Um, and how can line deal with absence and loss? And you know, because you know, a lot of my work was um, and still is in some ways quite you know physically additive or physically kind of um, um, verbose, mm -hmm. you know. But I think that there's been there's definitely been a tonal shift. I think energy and poetry mm. um, um, and and the, and the kind of issues around reading or reading and you know affect, um, which is you know very common, you know. The, the, it's called the affective tune, or the you know the affect tune. There's a lot, a lot of work I think that's been um, maybe in the last 15, 20 years, kind of resisting the kind of education that we had in London, you know, the kind of that kind of um, logocentric post-structuralist tradition. We're moving into kind of more affective ways of dealing with mm. you know objects. And, okay, I'll 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 I'll, have, I'll go back to that in a moment, but I also wanted to. Um, Pick up what you said. Something, something about the line, and is, do, do you mean in relation to, to drawing? Drawing, yeah, yeah, because that's again something that is notable about these works, which is the the, the kind of drawing element is much more uh, accentuated. Before there was a sort of sense of the form, almost like wrapping itself, you know, within itself, and and the the skin or the surface was uh, partly to a certain extent. Um, product of the process, you know, where you're not quite sure exactly what's going to happen when the, the latex and color mix, et cetera, and how it moves. Mm -hmm. But with these works, the element of drawings is much more kind of purposeful and much more kind of central to the significance of the works. Mm. So- um, I can say a bit about the light if you okay. want, yeah, if that's what, um, I mean, I think a lot of it is to do with, you know, doodling. You know, um, and um, uh, automatic uh, drawing, automatic writing. Um, so the, these are actually a lot of these works come out of a monotyping process. So um, they're monotyped onto skins of silicon. But the line itself, I mean, I remember I did a show about two or three years ago at the University of Virginia, which is where I, I work. Um, and somebody asked me uh, in the Q and A afterwards about you know what's the relationship between line and form. 
Mm. And uh, in answering that question, I realized that I thought, well, actually, line is form. And I understand, I understood the question because obviously you've got these dimensional, um, they're actually you know, styrofoam polystyrene sculpted forms. Um, but I also felt that, that, you know, the way that line gets articulated, particularly in printmaking, um, mm. and one of the things I, I really benefited from when I was teaching at the University of Iowa, which has got one of the, I guess, one of the kind of prominent printmaking programs in the US, and being in conversation with printmakers was just how they really get, they really geek out, they really get into the kind of the, mm. the, um, the mechanics and the process of how line gets articulated. Uh, through etching, through monotyping, through it in tally, you mm. know. Um, and I realized that, the, you know, for me, the way that the line gets gets to be in the world, you know, you think of people, like obvious people, like Saito, mm -hmm. for example, right? Um, that there is a form, there is an emotional form to mm. line. Um, and if you look around, you know, these, these, these pieces, which you can't see on this camera, but mm. there are different forms of line, you know, some are erratic, some are careful, some mm. feel like they're kind of mindless doodles and, and how those lines then get contorted, twisted, manipulated through these dimensional um, polystyrene. Mm -hmm. and, and the generation of the line, you, you said, is through automatic drawing? Or for, or... It's kind of continuous line, usually, for the most part. Um, but then it's, you but you're, you're not you're not looking at something and draw, it's it's no. kind of uh, no. yeah because we mentioned uh, we talked about a little bit uh, the other night about um, Georgiana Horton uh, who was a, a 19th century uh, painter working at the time of the pre raphaelites but they were uh, they pioneered ideas around uh, automatic drawing automatic painting you know and I was just wondering what your own relationship to drawing in that way is. I mean, we, we mentioned something to do with uh, writing yeah. and the way that it yeah. sort of makes it physical uh, once it's on, you know, once you translate it onto a surface. Um, um, but can you say a little bit more about, you know, the kind of impulse to make these automatic drawings? I think it's time. And I think that goes back to Mike Freeman. I think one of the things I realized that I, I learned from him more than anybody else was the articulation of painting as um, a, a kind of a really kind of profound, for lack of a better term, meditation on time. Mm -hmm. And for him, it was to do with these kind of sedimented layers of paint. But actually, in the early work from the, the late nineteen, late nineteen sixties, there was a lot of pencil drawing mm -hmm. showing through the paint. So you have these this layering. Um, so for me, it's, a lot of it's to do with time as well. It's time spent. You know, how do you spend your time? And you know, I, I didn't have a drawing practice. I think for um, my for my undergrad, I think I didn't really do 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 drawing mm. um, after my undergrad, really. Um, um, although I think you could argue that the earliest extruded silicon pieces were a form of indirect drawing. They were linear, mm. and um, so yeah, I I think that the the relationship to time is really important. Mm. Um, um, and thinking about that these are, you know, a kind of recording of time spent. Mm. Um, yeah, th and there's something interesting with, with your work, which I was thinking on the way here, the way in which, depending on um, perhaps who you're talking to, or maybe uh, when you might be speaking about your work, that one moment you could focus on, um, you know, painting discourse, you know, abstraction and mm. ideas of expanded painting and all that, you know. But at the same time, there's something which is uh, more personal, uh, running parallel to that. So it's not just, um, and when I say not just, I mean like it's not solely invested in the process and the materiality, like, you know, maybe there's people who uh, take that as the central concern, like Bernard Fries, et cetera. Mm -hmm. You know, this idea of uh, the work being the result of a process where they almost have no uh, agency you know, to, to create something, mm -hmm. but it's a set, a set of circumstances. But it's in your case, it's, it's the opposite, I, I feel, because it's sort of, um, there's a sense of, um, you know, thinking about these ideas of time and, um, your engagement with the work, it's almost like uh, this idea of sort of mindfulness, uh, or makes me think a little bit more to do with, um, you know, John Dewey, for example, or um, this another uh, philosopher, I'm not sure if you're aware of them, called 
Richard uh, Schusterman, and it talks about some aesthetics. Okay. You know, which yeah, is yeah, kind yeah. of this sort of. Um, it's almost like you know, it's it's similar to to Dewey, you know, that it's an experiential quality. You know, there's no separation between um, the body and experience and the work and experience. And I find that in some ways the drawing sort of has a way of almost like being the um, the bridge, you know, in a sense between um, the, the work and uh, yourself and, and and the viewer. You know, the way that we can follow that sort of path that you've uh, or, or the time that you have been mm -hmm. um... well i think the relationship to the body is important but not just in terms of you know the index you know mm. um, my hand making the work but um the, i think there's an oblique relationship to the body off, often the face and i think there are you know there are personal reasons for that but i also think you know you and i probably remember we we're, we're part of a I, I do remember at St. Martin's and afterwards conversations around really resisting, um, really resisting that 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 um, recall to the to the personal, you know, to the the biography mm. of the artist, own experiences. But I think, particularly over the last four or five years, I think that's almost impossible. Um, and but I, I sometimes, you know, I actually remember having a conversation with somebody. Um, an artist who I really respect over six or seven years ago about the reasons why an artist would want to resist that kind of recall to the personal end of the work. But for me, the work, you know, there's, there's almost always a relationship to the face um, and to, and to the, an, an oblique relationship to the body. So the body that's hidden, I'm talking about a human body, mm -hmm. right? My body um, um, and the aesthetics around something that is revealed, something that's concealed, um, we can talk about that in relationship to kind of sexuality and identity in some ways, which has come to more to the forefront in terms of a lens of looking at maybe contemporary aspects of contemporary painting. Mm. Um, but it's also there in the aesthetics of my work as well. You know, the titles I often use Welsh words, Greek words, fragments of words that um, they reveal as much as the, they conceal as much as they might reveal something. Mm. And I think if you look at the work, like even in, in the gallery today. You know, there is a kind of visceral embodied quality to the work, mm -hmm. but there's also the thing of, you know, you want to look behind or you want to look to the side or you don't really know what's under. Mm -hmm. um, I was talking to an artist in the space really today and they did, they were kind of asking me about the materials of the work. Um, and I think that, the, you know, hiding, like, so, so quite a few of the works are matted. So you don't mm -hmm. get really a sense of that it might be, you know, one material. Um, so I think there are narratives there within that that pertain to you know who I am, for example, mm. or you know my my kind of identity. Um, but I think they're filtered through this almost like this apology of like the way that I felt. Um, um, I think there's a politics around the personal that is is compl complicated, right? Um, and you know what gets declared and on what terms. Mm. Um, and, um, and and also, you know, when you work within, you know, the, the gallery system and the way the art is, even today, even if you have a politics of critiquing certain atomistic, atomistic ideas of selfhood, mm. you still get branded, you know, in, in particularly kind of obvious ways in, um, you know, when you get to show. And, mm. uh, yeah, it's, inter it's interesting that you um, focus specifically, or you mention specifically the face and then, this idea of like representation and um, this there's a linguist uh, or psychologist I think called Irvin Goffman and he wrote a book called Presentation of Self in Everyday Life I think like in the 60s you know and there's like a whole set of kind of ideas that rotate around the idea of if you think about it you know like the idea of the face like you know you know to lose face or you know sort of face off or face up you know um and uh, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, when we look at the work and we think about the work in terms of the body it, it's it's less obvious perhaps to think that there's a kind of almost like um uh you know idea of language that comes from the face that we all have a uh, deep very deep within. Uh, I don't know whether you've heard of something called the um, Macapan uh, pebble or Macapanska pebble. I don't it's, a, it's, a, it's a pebble about this big. It's about two to three million years old and it was found in um, 
it was found in the 1920s in South Africa, mm. or what is now in South Africa. And uh, it is believed that somebody approximately, you know, three million years ago, mm. uh, picked up this pebble uh, and took it back to their dwelling because the pebble has, um, it's been described sometimes as the pebble of many faces or something, and it has some marks on the pebble that ostensibly look like a face, you know. Mm. And, um, you know, some people sort of trace it to this sort of sense of kind of either development of sort of, you know, symbolic meaning or mm. language or empathy mm. much earlier than our, you know, usual understanding of when uh, forms of communication were developed, you know. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, but, uh, don't really, I mean, in terms of, <laughs> If you wanted to build something off that, um, you know, I think for me with the, with this work in terms of the face, I'm also thinking, you know, about um, you know, ideas of familiarity okay. um, and estrangement. I mean, there's certain things that happened to me in my life where there was definitely a sense of kind of alienation within my own. I had certain things that happened to my face at a particular formative stages and. Um, so the sense of something, you know, being embodied, but actually at the same time being a kind of place of loss, mm. a site of loss, or a site of kind of um, trauma or alienation. Um, mm. And um, it's funny that you mentioned earlier actually about the kind of early book about rapping, because mm -hmm. um, I was thinking about, you know, um, the work in terms of sometimes care, um, how careful you can be, how you care for an object, how you mm. care for um, a particular way of working. Um, um, and, and different ways of looking as well. You know, mm. I think there was this um, really, um, I can't remember the, um, the essay, I think it might have been Australian um, Elizabeth Gross. Um, and I think she was, uh, I think it was called the, the, the essay, I forget now. But she was talking about particular types of forms of looking at the end of this essay, like how you can glimpse at something or wink at something or, mm. you know, a, a long lingering stare as, as opposed to something that is, you know, fleeting. Um, and a kind of care that might be placed in that. So, you know, when you look at this work, you know, even, you know, in our own lives, right, the way that we address, um, you know, loved people that we care for, people that we might not have much time for, mm -hmm. strangers in the street, um, there's, I think that there is a material, there's a materiality about that, um, and, the, and the way that the face can be central to that. Um, you know, and that, that's why, you know, not to kind of bring it back to the show, but, um, you know, when I remember, I think it was actually when I was doing the PhD, I didn't know Henry Tonks's mm. surgical pastels. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, when I first came across them, realising that they were the, these sites of intense care, but also, you know, extreme horror. Mm. And, and the, the, the kind of materiality of the face can be something you would never imagine it would be through various horrific reasons. But there's something very intimate about those pastels. There's something for me... Um, incredibly tender about mm. these pastels that seem to kind of hit a chord with something I was trying to do with mm. with, with this with this work you know um, yeah, no, yeah. Uh, it's interesting because I, I, I am in some ways joining dots now because uh, I read in your uh, in your website I mean I just thought might as well find out a little bit about Neil, you know, before I go to the do so, you know, do some research, do some research, you know. <laughs> so start it, you know. And then oh, uh, I read, I read your, state, your statement, you know, and then it, 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 it said something about questions around prosthetics and abstraction, right? And yeah. I, and, I, and and it kind of it it, it sort of threw me off at first because we we talked about many things the other night, and I'm, I've known you for a long time, mm. yet. It's such a kind of uh, loaded word that I, I didn't, you know, I always tend to think of it more in terms of these ideas of kind of painting and materiality and perhaps people that you were influenced uh, once you were studying. But in some ways, when you're talking about those pastel drawings by Henry Tongs mm -hmm. and then prosthetics and then thinking about this, perhaps even in the way that sometimes there are those sort of um, drawings that are made on the body, you know, before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I, I think, I mean, that goes again back to the, the early research. And I, and I wrote about this when I was doing the PhD at the RCA, 
and I've kind of moved away from it a little bit. I think at the time what I was interested in was, um, you know, I, I'm really not a fan of the term expanded painting. Mm. Um, and and I, even though I was, I, I think I was looking at a lot of artists that kind of came under that umbrella mm. too. And I think there's a symposium happening right now on expanded painting, uh, Donald Maloney and some, some people. Mm. Um, and uh, I often felt that, and so the, the, the prosthetics for me was not just coming from like maybe prosthetic limbs, but prosthetic makeup. Mm -hmm. um, I was doing research into kind of material culture histories of plastic and different types of plastic, including you know, the origins of silicon, right? Like silicon is a, you know, a synthetic polymer that is very, very new and since 1942. Um, invented actually for the Second World War, mm. uh, a synthetic polymer. Um, but the reason why I was then looking into um, the evolution of medical prosthetics in terms of material, the, you know, the materials from, um, you know, wood to, to plastic to silicon parts so mm -hmm. um but i was also thinking about maybe the prosthetic prosthetic painting as a way of thinking differently about interdisciplinarity um painted in the expanded field mm -hmm. um, um but i mean you know all that sounds kind of jargonistic i think what mm -hmm. i was really interested in is where my particular concerns within painting mm -hmm. whether it be you know materiality process time within painting meets or kind of abuts with other other kind of uh, modes of cultural production. So it mm. might be, you know, um, uh, print traditions, it might be object making, it might be prosthetics. I was also thinking about um, prosthetic makeup and special effects as mm. well, because I know I grew up watching a lot of um, 80s horror films okay. and being fascinated by, um, you know... Can you name one? Oh yeah, Evil, Evil Dead 2, Evil Dead. Near, near Dark. Um, the Thing. The Thing, you know, all those things, yeah. you know, all those things um but i you know i was fascinated because it, you know, they also you know because you, know, you look at a film like evil dead 2 it's not going to be talked about quote unquote seriously right but there's there's a lot of complexity in that film in terms of its affective complexity mm. um narratively if you want to kind of you know follow some kind of um character narrative evaluation um it's it runs counter to the visual complexity of the film mm. in terms of what happens to the you know particular particular figures with these prosthetic special effects mm. um so i don't know where i'm going with that but but yeah we could easily run with that because uh, i love the whole connection again it's nice to have this conversation in that it uncovers something else uh and uh, th that connection to uh, horror films wasn't something that i thought about uh, but may maybe uh, you know you were talking about painting and maybe this is a good moment to bring it back specifically to this exhibition mm -hmm. um, and something that because um, you say painting and I think you know uh, it's something that I was wondering uh, you know which is notable with these works that you know that, that most of them are resting on this um, uh, support and the sort of print supports and uh, mm. I was wondering why um, and I guess you've answered it by saying painting. Mm. I was wondering why the works haven't made it to the floor. Why do they, um, you know, it goes back to maybe this vertical landscape yeah. that we talked at the beginning. Um, yeah, it's, I, mean, it's the, I mean, I guess that's one of the, um, because they're paintings and they live on the wall. Um, and I think that, I, you know, of all the things I look at, I'm informed mainly through histories of painting. And mm -hmm. I think that they need to have a frontality. Mm -hmm. They need to have a front and a back. They need to have people curious about looking at the, mm -hmm. you know, if you look at the sides and the back of the work, there's a completely different economy to the backs of them. Um, mm -hmm. But also the shelf, you know, I don't know, I mean, you know, Anthony Caro's um, table sculptures uh -huh. um, were also something I was really thinking about a lot because they they bring the work the work into um, you know aspects of still life the domestic. Um, the, I also don't don't necessarily see them as shallows. They they're actually I mean I, if you think about it they're lines mm. right they're, they're physical chunky kind of mm. lines. So the economy of that the type that type of physical line and the way that. Um, you know this thing this piece it's, it's unfair because people you can't really see um but you know the way that it actually comes off into physical space it's mm. kind of defying gravity some 
you know, are propped up on, on their lines, some are kind of hugging and kind of curling over the lines. So I think there's something about the relationship to touch, mm. which we didn't talk about, um, the haptic. Um, so, you know, the you know in relation to, you might think about the relationship between word and sound in, in energy, mm. right? Um, and you think about, you know, touch and image within, mm. within painting. Um, because touch is an incredibly important part of painting. Mm. And actually, one of, the, one of the interesting things about Henry Tonks was that um, his sense of touch, the, 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 the role of touch within, within drawing and painting is really important to him. Um, and so that, the shelf, you know, the, the way these things, um, uh, what supports them mm. um, in different ways throughout the exhibition. Mm. Um, I, I don't think that's, you know, it sound, might sound simplistic to frame it that way, but I think it can... It can lead to, to complicated things because you know it's the way that we physically might touch each other, mm -hmm. right? But also touched in, in an emotional sense as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it looks so yeah. So these these shells, but actually the 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 the, ge the genesis was actually looking at Anthony Caro's table sculptures, right? Which I I love those uh, those things. You know, mm -hmm. they're, just just uh, to yeah. go back to what you're saying then, because I think. It'd be interesting to clarify in some ways because, I, as I understand it, or as I, you know, sort of think around this, there, there is a difference actually between talking about this idea of of tactility, of touch, and the haptic, because the haptic is it's almost like uh, it's not quite like synesthesia, but it's more like it's touched through sight, you know, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and in some ways this. The, I'm just being. Um, I'm just. I'm just sort of, in some ways, ask asking whether you can say something about that because uh, you mentioned both haptic, but then also this idea of like touch, uh, real touch, but then also the metaphor of touch. Um, and I was thinking about um, uh, one of the workshops that the Bauhaus had mm. um, in the preliminary course. Um, most people are familiar with, you know, Joseph Albers, uh, in, you know, colour sort of workshops, etc. Sure. Yeah. But one that is uh, less known, which you might know, it was called the Matière, mm -hmm. and you know, it's like a in the initial stage, what would be the kind of foundation course at the Bauhaus? Uh, students were asked to do these kind of like. Uh, haptic exercises so they weren't artworks you know they, they literally had to kind of place things next to each other and try and experience that sense of how something might feel um, or emphasize the difference between something that is uh, soft or something that is shiny and they would do all these little exercises uh, there are very few photographs left of the examples of the things that they made because they were kind of they were quite ephemeral mm -hmm. uh, but what i do remember is that the emphasis there wasn't so much how we tend to think around for example texture in terms of something like mm -hmm. oh nice sort of you know, sort of uh, texture whatever but it was more to do with this sense being sensitive to texture through through sight mm -hmm. and i just wondered whether that's something that you're thinking about or whether you want to maybe sort of elicit a more sort of direct response from from the audience in terms of you know how you relate to the work yeah i think you know i i would filter it through i mean you know, obviously it goes back to in some ways my crewman as well right but touch was also an incredibly um important part of his practice um i mean i i'll go back to it in of care i think it's for me mm. I and mean, i actually didn't know that uh, that that um albert's exercise about mm. us um, but you know, it, it can work on multiple levels, right? I mean, uh, in the studio when I'm making things, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, you know, that relationship between the eye and the hand mm -hmm. um, is incredibly important. Um, but I also think that when I look at work as well, you know, including you know this work in some ways, but um, I'm also not all work because I think you know different kinds of artists, different kinds of practice practices elicit. Mm -hmm. um, different calls, right? They call you in different ways. Or there's a different, there are many different calls in terms of how you can approach, you know, being with a, with a work. Um, but I'm also, as a viewer, you know, mm. not only as a viewer in terms of once I finish a work, I'm, I'm a viewer of my work, but looking at the work. Um, particularly particular, uh, particular aspects of painting, I'm thinking about 
that um, that relationship um, and the you know and how that might affect narrative or how how you might um, interpret a work. Mm. Um, so yeah. Um, oh, hello. I'm thinking um, you're also um, you're, you're traveling back on Monday to tomorrow. You're traveling back tomorrow. Yeah. You're teaching. I'm teaching Monday, Monday Virginia Monday. Yeah. Uh, but at some point, you also mentioned um, about possibly moving to Athens. Yes. Yes, I have. Yeah. 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 Uh, which might be quite a an interesting thing to do in terms of um, thinking about sculpture, thinking about the frieze, um, and something that I discovered recently, I don't know whether it's of interest to you or whether you know of this, something, and which is probably widely known, but I only found out about recently, uh, was about uh, the sort of polychrom poly polychromy of, of Greek. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, Absolutely. sculpture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's, it's they're, they're kind of known for this kind of like, um, you know, Lived shiny, white, white yeah. sort of, uh, you know, these ideas of classicism stem from a kind of misunderstanding or misrepresentation of the work. Totally. In the 18th century, there was a historian who's declared that these works were the embodiment of classicism through mm -hmm. their sort of whiteness, etc. And, and it turns mm -hmm. out that, in fact, they were like really brightly painted, you know, really very polychromatic yeah there was there was a show actually when i was in athens a couple of years ago that was restaging a lot of the sculptures with the original well the, the supposed uh, original colors based on the the chemical mm. compounds found on, on the sculptures mm. and yeah i mean obviously aesthetically look completely different to that um, mm. often um you know um they show classicism which is mm. you know kind of corny in a way Mm. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I'm spending more time in Athens, and um, I mean, yeah, it's it's a city that I mean, if you want to talk about sedimentation of time, mm. you know, where you can look at a building that's you know three years old, and then you look at something that's you know twenty seven hundred years old. Mm. Um, um, yeah, so there's a, there's a, there's a lot there. I think also it's to do with you know I I really I really valued my time in London in the sense that it's a, it's a city that you can walk around mm. you know there's a um, you know the, the the sense of being embodied in a place through through walking um, and and seeing the kind of physicality of, of a city through you know and, and the residue of time mm. um, and Athens has that you know in in um, in abundance mm. so. Um, yeah, and also, you know, it, it, this is going to be really boring, but like, there might be some people listening in Virginia, so be careful what I say about, um, you know, not being polemical about uh, Charlottesville, but, you know, I, you don't walk around that much um, in, um, you know, you can go hiking. Right. Um, but I actually like a more kind of free, fo free form, right. you know, unscripted walk wherever you want. Yeah, um, now, yeah. So. So, well, I mean, not not quite, hopefully but, not off language. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, Neil, we have some people with us today, so I just wonder whether maybe now would be a good time to see if uh, anybody has any questions or any yeah. thoughts, any observations about the exhibition or anything that they want you to uh, sort of go again. I did ask you a question before. Um, you mentioned that you were going to Athens, and then you went to Athens. The which side? Can you say that again? You start with a shape. You start with kind of sculpture, mm. and then does the skin? Oh, okay. Relate to that, or yeah. How, what is the so should we ask the question again for the? Um, so do you start with the sculpture first or the skin first, yeah. right? Um, um, recently, they I have multiple sculpted forms in the studio, almost like um, I used to call them prosthetic limbs. Um, but they, so I have an inventory of forms that are there. Usually what I do is at the moment, I, I'll have a, a whiteboard um, flat and there's a lot of drawing and painting that happens. And, and when I feel like there's something interesting that happens within the drawing process or whatever's on there, um, I'll, I'll um, create a skin, a, a monotype skin for that. Mm. Um, and then I'll, I'll figure out, you know, um, maybe a form. Um, 
so the forms are made technically, the, the forms are kind of made before, um, but they don't necessarily have a direct, you know, I don't know, for example, which form is going to fit which skin they, and they often don't, whenever I try to do that, whenever I try to kind of script, well, this form is going to fit this, it tends to kind of undermine me in some ways. Um, yeah. I wonder, you've, you've talked a lot about body, space, painting, image. You haven't said much about architecture, and I know that mm. space and how things are arranged in space is, is really important to you know, compositionally in terms of thinking about the way yeah. sculpture. I wonder if you can maybe talk about that. Yeah, that's a good, yeah, that's a good. I, it's funny because I, I, I did a really, probably shouldn't say this, I did a really bad talk for South Dakota State University last week, which I, I, I mumbled my way through. But that was the first time when I actually really changed the environment of the gallery. I'm really fussy on light is very important to me. Um, I know that the gallery here is 4,000 Kelvin light, and I prefer 5,000 Kelvin um, light, um, um, which is fine. You know, 4,000 is great for it. <laughs> um, um, 3,500, we wouldn't be able to work with that. Um, but in terms of the atmospherics and the architecture, so I've had to, in, in recent shows, um, build, you know, very subtle architectural mm. ledges. Um, so I'm thinking about the the the, the space of the gallery, or whatever it might be. It doesn't have to be a gallery, but I'm thinking about the space that you, not not necessarily sociopolitically, but in terms of the kind of you know the phenomenology of the space, the kind of you know affective relationship to the space that it becomes a container for the work. It's a frame for the work, right? Um, so, for example, in this show. What was really important as you walk into the space that you know the, in terms of your, 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 your lines of sight you're either seeing something frontal or side frontal side wherever you, often wherever you walk through the space um for me that there's an architecture to that i used to work with a gallery in new york called henry back architecture and sadly henry henry's not with us anymore but you know that that gave me a sensitivity to you know the way that you know certain artists, particularly Henry, was thinking about that space, that gallery, in terms of um, you know. So it's not just about having a painting on a wall, right? It's having the the space as a container, right? And then a set of relations within that container that that are um, creating some kind of narrative, or not necessarily narrative, but creating some sense of scripted experience through the space. Um, and and I think this show. You know, I, I, I try to make sure that wherever you are in this space, there are, you know, glimpses, frontal, you know. So you, the work on this space as a container will script different ways of looking. And I think that that pertains to architecture, you know, as well as painting. So, mm. um, but the first, and we, weirdly enough, one of the reasons why that happened in South Dakota was because the gallery was almost kind of unworkable, right? The lighting was... 3500 3500 kelvin the walls had rippled orange peel texture um there were skirting boards and plug sockets everywhere and i and i really needed to con i really needed to you know to, to create the right container for the work mm -hmm. so that you could see the drawings and see the work in a, in a particular way um I'm gonna. I sound like a like a like a prima donna, you know, completely. Whatever. <laughs> I just think it's important in terms of how when you're in a space and actually that you know like what, what, whatever's there is really important, mm. right? You know. Um, that removal and in order to see something independently of the noise, mm. everything else you have to create that artificial mm. space. Mm. Otherwise, how can you move things as separate or other things? Yeah, and sometimes people don't notice these things. There's, there's a really, really important show of Australian Aboriginal bark paintings on at the Freeland Museum in, in Charlottesville right now. This will make sense in a second. Um, and, uh, you know, the Freeland has a particular room with these bark paintings. And there is this horrible cherub hanging over one of the arches, right? Um, and they couldn't do anything about that, right? It was just there. And so people were walking in and talking about the show. I was there with my students. And it was amazing how people blocked out that cherub as if it didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And it was an incredibly important thing. And actually, you know, if you want to actually think about the politics of that, right? Mm -hmm. um, not entirely a great choice either, you know? Um, but those things are... It's amazing what sometimes people will pretend not to see in a space, sometimes. Um, yeah, architecture.
Do we have any more questions while we're still recording? Yes. I have a question. Um, hello. Hello. Again. Um, I know you've done a lot of teaching and um, yeah. you run your own residency. Yeah. How how or, or do you think that's impacted your practice? The sort of you know, do you see that as a separate, discrete kind of strand of artistic activity, mm. or is there something that does that in some way inform or has it mm. your you know the, these works and your kind of making practice? Totally. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I started to see the residency because it's connected to Frank Mike, Mike Freeman, right? Yeah. I the the residency that I run in, in Charlottesville. I mean Virginia's here today, maybe she could answer the question more than I can. But I I, I I'm I'm starting well, not starting, I think over the last few years I'm really I'm I'm wanting to see it and, and uh, I am seeing it as, as holistic. Like I don't think that the residency that I run and you know the the custodianship over Freeman's this um life's work, for example. Um you know, it's about conversations and it's about community and i know that i've thrived the, the most as an artist with community and conversation and dialogue so for me the residency program which is multi-pronged at the moment it's charlottesville it's things happening in wales um being in conversation with young artists you know i i think there's something important about intergenerational conversation amongst artists um you know juan is much older than me you know so the conversations <laughs> that we have um, in terms of how it's affected my practice. I mean, look, I mean, the relationship, the intergenerational conversation between myself and Mike Freeman. I mean, like, I wouldn't be making this work without it. Um, more recently, in conversations that I have with, you know, I remember conversation. Well, even I was in Virginia studio in in um, in uh, Virginia Beach uh, um, three weeks ago, two weeks ago. Um, Two weeks ago, and um, you know, I, I, it's, it's incredibly important. I, I, I think it's, um, I, I see it as part of my, my practice. Mm -hmm. Um, different components, perhaps. Um, and I, I, I think accumulatively over the years, these conversations with with artists through the residency, mm -hmm. um, uh, they, they'll inf influence my practice for sure. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Any more while we're recording? I'm sure we have a glass of wine here in the middle while we're in the chat. Thank you. Oh, I want to say before we finish as well, just a big thank you to um, Gabriel Godin, who is an artist, an artist that works with Fred and helped me with the show this week. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Fred, Fred for, you know, giving me the opportunity. Um, Juan for kindly um, no, doing this. Thank you very much. Yeah. To people. Thank you all for being here today. Yeah. Thank you.